Um, some of you might know me because I've done um, things on folklore and haunted houses with Romance in the Gothic before. Some of you might also be aware of my other stuff because I do tend to get around a bit on, on the interwebs. Um, just in case anyone doesn't know who I am and is obviously curious, I am... Well, I wouldn't call myself a folklorist, but Mark from the Folklore Podcast insists that I am, so I'll take it. Um, and I also do write gothic fiction, and I've only put Black Dog and other gothic tales in there because of the fact that they're all based on either folklore that exists or folklore I've made up. So um, it just shows how folklore and fiction go together really well. I am a former ghost hunter. Um, I am actually going to be going live on Instagram at four o'clock today. Um, and my Instagram's just Icy Sedgwick uh, talking about some of my experiences because people keep asking. So if you're interested, there you go. And I do host the Fabulous Folklore podcast where you can get your fix of Fabulous Folklore in 15 minutes or less. And then there's my sharing link as well. Um, any monies I make tend to just go into like paying for web hosting and really boring stuff like that. So it's not like I'm Scrooge McDuck swimming around in all the money that I make. It uh, pretty much goes straight back out again to fund um, doing these things. But anyway, so that's me. Um, I wanted to, uh, well, first of all, start off with um, an image of the part of the world um, that we're gonna be sort of uh, focusing on um, for this uh, for this talk. Because obviously it's, it's always nice to share folklore from like the part of the world where I'm from um, and a lot of the folklore does kind of swing between sort of scary to just plain weird and then there's everything in between. So I want to start off by actually defining what I mean by northern folklore because northern if you're in the UK you'll know this is an incredibly slippery term and I've even heard people as far south as Birmingham say that they're northern. So how do you define the north and how do you differentiate between the northwest and the northeast and you know, if you look at a map of the UK, once you get past York, there's not really that much in the way of cities until you get to like Middlesbrough, Sunderland and then Newcastle. So anywhere that I draw a line to say anything above this is the north, somebody south of that line is going to feel aggrieved. So I'm like, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to follow the Romans lead and I'm just going to use Hadrian's Wall. It is the most iconic dividing line that I can find. So there you go. Blame the Romans. And also, just because it's always good to mention this, um, this is the famous Sycamore Gap. And if you've ever seen Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and let's be honest, it is on like every bank holiday in the UK, then you will recognise this bit from where uh, Robin and Azima are basically having a bit of a chat about what they're going to do. Why Robin would land at Dover, go all the way up to Hadrian's Wall and then go back down to Nottingham was never explained in the film, but I am digressing at this point. So... The part of the world that we are looking at today, um, and thank you to Google Maps for all of the screenshots that I've taken. This is the border between Scotland and England as it currently stands. Um, there was some discussion on Twitter the other day of moving it back to Hadrian's Wall. Um, it is approximate because I did do it in Photoshop, but it gives you the main idea that that's the difference between Scotland and England. And the two English counties that border Scotland are Cumbria and Northumberland. And indeed, Northumberland is actually what remains of the ancient kingdom of Northumbria. Now, it used to stretch all the way up to Edinburgh in the north, which isn't on the map, um, and all the way down to the Humber in the south. So it was massive. But even in its present state, Northumberland apparently has more castles than any other English county and also once produced most of the coal that powered the rest of the country, particularly during the Industrial Revolution. Nowadays, you're more likely to see it as a filming location. And if you see that big green splodge just south of the uh, the red line there, that's the Kielder um, Forest Park. That's now a dark sky park if you're into astronomy. So that's the current border. Um, and that's the old one. Again, it's incredibly approximate because much of Hadrian's Wall isn't there now because it's basically been stolen uh, to form houses in the area because, like, you know, northerners are nothing if not recyclers. So... Uh, Hadrian's Wall is, I think it's famous world over really, and work finished on the wall in 130 AD. There was another one further north, uh, the Antonine Wall, but we're not going to get into that one. Most people think that Hadrian's Wall was to keep the Scots out, which isn't actually entirely true, um, because obviously the people who lived in Northumberland were actually um, traders with the Romans, so essentially the Hadrian's Wall 
was also a customs point and a tax border uh, more than anything else. But you do get a bit of a triangular shape between the current border and the wall. And this particular part of the, the world has been referred to as the borderlands for quite a while. So it sounds even more like something out of Game of the Thrones now, out of Game of Thrones even, sorry. And where my house is, is north of, of Hadrian's Wall. So this talk is coming to you from beyond the wall, which is quite cool. Um, but that in and of itself is one of the reasons why I've actually chosen this region for tales of folklore and superstition, because you've got the import of Roman practices, Roman rituals, even gods. You've got the tumultuous history of the Reavers. People have been fighting over this land for centuries and it switched from Scotland to England and back again. The Reaver families often had quite vicious feuds that just completely ignored the fact that the border was even there. We've had Viking raids over the years. Um, we had the flourishing Christian centre on Lindisfarne. Um, and also the great scholar Bede was stationed along the Tyne at Jarrow. So it's been an area where there's been a lot of um, contestation over who actually owns the land. So it's quite a liminal space because it's not really Scottish, but it's also not really English either. So it's perfect for the Gothic crowd. So as part of this compendium of Northern folklore, we're going to have a look at vampires, red caps, bog guests, dragons, wizards, sprites, fairies, and even a local Celtic god. I have had to be quite strict and I have left out ghost stories because, I mean, you can't really move for them uh, here. And it's hard to find a definitive definition for folklore, but there are some who argue that ghost stories are like their own separate category. So I've left them out in favour of our more fantastical beasts, which give you a bit more of an idea of the strange creatures and powerful beings that dwell in these parts. My sources for this are primarily these two books and um, the one on the left has probably one of the longest book titles ever and its full name is The Local Historian's Table Book of Remarkable Occurrences, Historical Facts, Traditions, Legendary and Descriptive Ballads connected with the counties of Newcastle upon Tyne, Northumberland and Durham. And it was compiled in 1846 um, by M.A. Richardson. And it's basically a lot of the stories that we know in this part of the world. The other one is Notes on the Folklore of the Northern Counties of England and the Borders by William Henderson from 1879. And both of those are available for free on Internet Archive. So we're going to kick off proceedings by going to Annick. So I am going to use maps to show you where these things are um, in case you're not familiar, because obviously... A lot of people don't really know what's going on in this part of the world. Um, so there's Anik, and we're going to start with a creature that you might not automatically associate with the British Isles. And if you think of vampires, you probably think of some creature skulking in its ancestral tomb or a forbidding castle amid a haunted forest. Um, it just won't. And um, and you you sort of might think of obviously somebody. Can can people mute themselves? that's kind of off-putting um they can't seem to mute her yeah anyway um so you might sort of think of of that kind of image of the european vampire and it's not entirely true to say that it was imported to england by the likes of john polidori and bram stoker because prior to the Highgate and Glasgow vampires of the 20th century, Britain does have its own tales, although they're not usually called vampires in these stories, but we're going to look at them anyway. So we're going to start off with, um, obviously that's where Annick is on the map, um, and you might recognise Annick Castle from the first couple of Harry Potter films, uh, where he has his flying lesson out in the, um, in the grounds, and... Annick's pretty much famous mostly for the castle and the Annick garden now. But we're going to go back to 1196, where a foul creature began to crawl from its grave every night roaming the streets. And apparently, according to the legends, its very breath was noxious and a plague outbreak actually followed in its wake. Two local men decided enough was enough and the only way to end the plague outbreak would be to dispatch the creature. So according to William of Newborough, who was a monk who recorded the account, they went off to dig up the monster, as you do. But its grave was nearer the surface than they thought it would be and when they actually dug it up, it was swollen and its shroud was a tattered mess and its hideous features were red with blood. In a lot of the accounts, it's actually described as looking a little bit like a leech. So they did what any brave northern men would do, and they attacked it with a spade. 
and blood gushed forth apparently from the many victims that it had fed on. But they actually didn't end there. They removed the heart and burned the body. What they did with the heart, I'm not sure, but they did at least burn what was left. And William of Newburgh is at pains to assure his readers that the destruction of the corpse ended the plague outbreak altogether. So in a, in a typical case as well, the stories mirroring each other across the border, which let's remember were a lot more uh, porous in earlier centuries, Melrose in the Scottish borders has a very similar vampire tale. And if that's where Annick is on the right, um, you can see over on the left, that's where Melrose is. So that is actually in Scotland. And here, a corpse attacked a monk. And in a manner not entirely befitting a man of God, he actually hit the corpse with an axe and then chased it back to its grave, which I always think that that's the kind of uh, would-be Van Helsing I'd like to see more of. And he basically gathered a, a group together the next day to dig it up. And they found that a huge amount of blood and gore had flowed into the grave from its wound. Now, there isn't really any indication of what happened after that. And there's also no way of knowing what was really going on with these stories. And what's quite interesting is neither account actually gives us any indication of who these monstrous corpses actually were. Presumably, if they had graves, they had names. But the names and the names of those who accosted them have been lost to time. And instead, it's a destruction of the creature that takes on the central importance. Now, the Annex story would suggest a way to rationalise a plague outbreak many centuries before germ theory or the identification of the plague bacteria. But the Melrose story does feel quite incomplete, as if the, the corpse uh, that attacked the monk wasn't actually a corpse at all. Um, there isn't really anything to indicate a vampire attack other than labelling the attacker a corpse. But in such times as when medical knowledge was sorely lacking, I can't help wondering, was that actually a victim of catalepsy who was buried alive yet somehow able to escape the grave? That does, of course, mean that our monk um, was essentially uh, committing manslaughter. But, you know, in such times, I guess he was probably terrified. And such creatures do rarely make appearances in national folklore, let alone northern folklore. And the only other sort of like really famous one in this neck of the woods is the vampire of Croglin Grange, which is a Cumbrian story, but that does lie beyond our remit here because it's too far south. But you do have these stories of monsters that lie in an unquiet grave and they creep forth by night um, and then they do so in order to actively feed on the living. So in a lot of ways, they do tick all the boxes for vampires. It's just they're not quite as, how do we say, aristocratic as uh, John Polidori and Bram Stoker would leave us to, lead us to believe that they actually are. So it is quite wise, I think, at this point to segue from the vampire to another bloodthirsty creature of the borders, and that's the vicious red cap. And for the unwary visitor to their lair, um, they can be deeply dangerous. And the borders is basically where Melrose is on this map. It's kind of that whole area literally along the border with England. And red caps are classified as goblins, um, and that's a word that's rarely attached to anything positive, and you do find them most often in border folklore. And this is an artist's impression by Eugene Smith of what one may look like. Now, according to William Henderson, the red caps live in the string of ruined castles that stretch along the border between England and Scotland. And these castles obviously are a good indication of the quite bloodthirsty history um, that we've had. And the red caps do favour castles that saw particularly violent or tyrannical events. And some people believe that his name comes from his tendency to soak his cap in fresh blood, which is why they're also called bloody caps as well. There was a claim that red caps couldn't let the blood dry out because they would die if it did. Although I do have to wonder if they live in Roman castles, quite where exactly are they finding a steady supply of victims uh, in which to keep their caps wet. But that bit's sort of been lost to time as well. Henderson claims that red caps appear as old men and they've got long tangled hair, flaming red eyes and vicious talons. So with a description like that, you would think most people would avoid them. And for those daft enough to venture too close, he throws large stones at them. The unlucky ones that he hits end up providing the fresh blood for his cap. But they also apparently wear iron boots, which you can see in this particular drawing and carry an iron pike. Although apparently, despite the fact that they're wearing iron boots, which one would imagine would make running a little bit difficult, you'd be hard pressed to outrun one. So if you do ever find yourself facing down a red cap, 
apparently holding uh, holding up a cross would drive him away or you could quote the bible at them and then if you do either of those things he will disappear disappear in a flash of flames and leave behind a large tooth uh, it does all sound a little bit spectacular um and a lot of it is kind of it's written in such a way as to think that that's what people believed would happen rather than there being any actual witnesses to this but you know that's folklore for you Henderson does note that there is also an existence of a thing called the Dunta or Powry in other border ruins, and they are actually harbingers of doom, and they make noises that act as death omens. And basically, Henderson reckons that the Picts who built these border castles used human blood to purify the foundation stones. So in doing this, they then created resident ghosts in the buildings that would allegedly protect them. And some people wonder if the spirits of these sacrifices are the ones that take on the form of red caps or dunters. Now, this is Hermitage Castle, and with Lord William de Soulis, who lived there, apparently had a red cap as a familiar, and it was named Robin Redcap in that marvelous way of not being particularly imaginative with names. Now, Robin Redcap apparently rampaged around William's lands. And Lord Sulis also allegedly practiced the black art. And then he would receive advice about this from his red cap. And Sir Walter Scott actually collected a Scottish ballad about the pair. And in it, Robin lives in a chest and then enchants William so that he may repel metal weapons. And according to Scott, um, red cap is a popular appellation of that class of spirits which haunt old castles. Every ruined tower in the south of Scotland is supposed to have an inhabitant of this species. Now, I do wonder in like the days of things like the National Trust and whatnot, exactly how helpful that would be to have a, a murderous little goblin living in your castle. But I don't know, maybe it would be good for souvenirs. But either way, in the legends, William was wrapped in lead and boiled to death in a cauldron. Um, and because obviously, if you think about it, if you're impervious to metal weapons, you've got to find some way of bumping the guy off. But the legend is a lot more fanciful than the truth, because William did actually end his days in Dumbarton Castle after confessing his part in the, in the 1320 conspiracy against Robert the Bruce. Obviously, that doesn't sound quite as heavy metal as being wrapped in lead and boiled to death. But there we go. You can still visit uh, Hermitage Castle, but obviously, if you do, keep your wits about you because no one wants to provide new dye for a red caps hat. And what's the time? Obviously I will stick, uh, probably a break in after this one and then we can do questions and people can like make cups of tea and stuff. Cause I wouldn't want to keep anyone from their tea cause that's just mean. Uh, we are going to move however, from the red cap to another uh, dimin diminutive even bloodthirsty creature. And we're going to move to Roth the Simon side Hills near Rothbury for this one. So you can see there that it, you're just on the edge of Northumberland National Park for this one. And Northumberland, if you've never been to Northumberland, it's kind of hard to like imagine how beautiful it is, but how bleak the scenery is at the same time. And it's stunningly beautiful no matter what time of year you see it, apart from when it's absolutely throwing it down. But at the same time, it's the absolute epitome of wild. And this is the kind of scenery that we're talking about. Um, and it's not like the charming English countryside of the Cotswolds and, you know, it's not like the, the open expanses of the Norfolk Broads. It's this windswept, desolate place where you just don't get many people living there. And the people that do are quite hardy because they have to be. Um, so you can kind of imagine finding the Simon Side Dwarves as they're known in such an inhospitable um, location. When I say dwarves, obviously don't think of Tolkien's dwarves um, or indeed Snow White's um, because this particular set of uh, people, uh, essentially they lure lost travellers to their doom on the moors. So this is the kind of thing that you find quite a lot on the moors. It's basically a bog and the Simon Side dwarves are sometimes called the fairy folk or the little people. They're also known as the brown men of the moors or bogles. And an article in the West Morning News in 1923 actually likened them to the kobolds in Germany and pixies in the west of England. And essentially, they're a little bit like Will of the Wisp, so they kind of carry lights and scamper around in the hills. And if they see a solitary traveller, they lead them to their doom. And then, like the lights uh, in Will of the Wisp, the dwarves always disappear at dawn. So if you think about it, if you're a solitary traveller and you see a light on the moor, you're probably likely to go towards it if you don't know where you are and then splash, you'd land in one of these bogs. So 
the bogs are an ever-present danger if you do leave the established trail it would be quite easy to also do that by accident and now the hills are really popular with walkers and climbers and photographers and I'm presuming dog walkers at the moment and more people than ever are essentially finding their way into the dwarves territory. Now um, they are also known as um, the Durgar which many people think and this is another example of the kind of um, terrain that we're talking about and many people think that the word Durgar comes from the old Norse word for dwarves which is Dvergar um, or it might also relate to the regional dialect because the words Dirk and Dirk, essentially the same, both mean dwarf. And you do find a lot of slippages between old uh, Norse words and the northern dialects of both Northumberland and Newcastle. So there's quite a lot of the words that we use even now as part of the Geordie dialect, which are actually understandable to Norwegians. And that's clearly because of the Viking incursions of earlier centuries. Now, a lot of people when they do talk about the Durgar, they talk about their strength and the magical powers, but also their links to like the earth and nature. So writing in the Newcastle Chronicle, Reverend Oliver Heslop referred to the Durgar as a goblin race of beings, and he actually categorizes them alongside brownies instead of fairies. And according to Heslop, the Durgar also set the huge wheel of tossing watermill a going at night, as well as luring travelers into the bog. So they're sort of interfering as well as dangerous in a lot of ways and Newcastle Quran actually referred to the Simon Side Dwarves noting that it was dangerous for the solitary wanderer to venture among the tribe of ugly elves and dwarves now these are articles from like 1888 and 1889 so they're still talking about these creatures in the late 19th century and the, the newspaper articles about them are kind of a little bit they sit on the fence a bit about whether they're actually real or it's just what people believe um, which, you know, it's quite a good way to hedge your bets, I guess. But one of the really common tales, and this is one that you get from Henderson's table books, obviously this is like uh, 1846, involves a man who was travelling to Rothbury, and the journey essentially took longer than he was expecting. So he stumbles across a little hut on the moor, and he's like, great, excellent, I can find shelter for the night, because you wouldn't want to be wandering around on the moor. So inside the hut, he found a dying fire, two stones and two gate posts. So he sat down on one of the stones and then added some wood to the fire. And then you sitting there for a little while and everything seemed fine until a small figure waddled into the hut and then sat on the other stone. And it was really weird because he totally ignored the bewildered traveller who's like, I don't know what's going on. I just say nothing. That'll be easier. So he's just sitting there watching this little chap. And as the fire began to die down, the traveller then snapped a piece of wood and added it to the embers. And then the dwarf at this point finally notices him, glares at him, and then takes up one of the gateposts, which he then breaks over his knee and throws it onto the fire. And the traveller's like, oh, I don't think he's very happy with me. And he realises that he's angered his host. So he just remains completely silent and lets the fire die out. And somehow, and I find this really quite impressive, he manages to fall asleep sitting up. When dawn breaks the following day, the man wakes up and he finds himself sitting on a stone on the moor and the dwarf, his hut and the fire had all vanished. That was weird enough, but then to his horror, he realised that the stone he was sitting on was actually right at the edge of a tall cliff. So like one of these escarpments that you see in the image. And if he'd moved at any point during the night, he would have fallen to his death. Obviously, thankfully, he didn't. And that's how he could then get back to town and tell people about his ordeal. Another tale describes a man who actually deliberately went looking for them to prove they didn't exist, which is just such a northern thing to do. Um, and he went out into the moors and called out a northern word, a local word even meaning light, and then a light suddenly appeared on the moor in response. So the man then moved some way towards it, but then stopped and threw a clod of earth into a bog. So the light then went out, and the man's like, aha, I fooled the dwarves, they think I've fallen into the bog. Two tries again. And he cries out, tint, tint. And this time, however, the dwarves aren't having any of his nonsense and he finds himself surrounded by them. And each of them is holding a lit torch and a club, which always kind of makes me think a little bit of like grab your torch and pitchfork, but it's like the other way around. The man finally realises the dangers that he's in. But again, northerner to the last charges at the group of dwarves that surrounding him, which, you know, is quite impressive in its own way. And he thought he knocked one over, but his staff didn't actually appear to touch anything solid. It just kind of passed straight through the figure. The dwarves all vanished and the man thinks, great, awesome, I've won. 
but nothing is ever that simple in folklore. So they all then reappeared with reinforcements and the man did what I think anybody would do at this point and he fainted with shock. Um, so when he woke up at dawn, the dwarves had actually disappeared and he could head home. So at least it left him alone, but I'm assuming he was like, yeah, no, they, they exist. I'm not doing that again. And our third tale that we're going to have a look at about the dwarves actually takes place during the day. And this sees two men encounter a dwarf, not one on his own. So they travelled up to Rothbury from Newcastle to enjoy the shooting in the area, because as you can imagine, moorland, obviously there's plenty of birds and what have you. And after a morning of hunting, they then stop in a clearing among the heather to eat their lunch. And a little short man dressed in clothes, the same shade as the bracken, just walks into the clearing. And this seems to be a bit of a distinction between the Durgar and the fairies, because in Northumbrian law, the fairies usually wear green and they've got sort of flaxen or blonde hair. But this little chap was wearing brown. So straight away, you're like, ooh, something's going on here. So he asked the two young men if they knew who he was. And again, this is the kind of fabulous scenery that this would have taken place in. And the younger man replies to the Lord of the Manor and then offers to hand over the birds that they'd shot. Now, the dwarf declined, claiming that he's a vegetarian and then invites the two men to join him for a meal instead. Now, the younger man was quite happy to accept, but the older man is like, hang on, this isn't right, and politely refuses and then hauls his friend back to Rothbury. And then when they got back, they told the landlord the story and the locals who'd overheard this story praised their decision to return because obviously the Simon Side dwarves enjoyed luring humans into their lair before feasting on them. So at least in this case, they've managed to escape. And you've probably already twigged what the moral of these stories is. And it's basically don't go wandering on the moors because on one hand, that's their space. That's like their land. And on the other hand, it's incredibly dangerous and unforgiving, particularly in the dark. So in some ways, the dwarves kind of become like cautionary tales to keep people on safer routes rather than venturing out on their own into the dark on the moor. So the traveller who accepts the offer of shelter almost ends up going over the side of a cliff. And then the guy who tries to disprove they're even real does the opposite. And then the hunters almost end up on the menu themselves. And the third story is quite unusual because it happens during the day, whereas the other dwarf stories kind of focus on their disappearance during daylight hours. But it still involves the men needing to get back to civilization to reach safety. How very gothic. The wilderness in this case proves near fatal and it's only being around other humans and the man-made built environment that provides any sense of safety or security. And we do need to remember that there is a difference between the Durgar and the fairies because we're going to look at fairies later on because there's a lot of fairy stories in Northumberland folklore. But they often hide in plain sight and they're usually obscured by glamours or they just hide away in underground layers. They don't really want to have that much to do with people. Whereas on this hand, the dwarves actually go looking for the travellers because they're not punishing trespassers. They're just actually looking for their dinner. And this is what Rothbury looks like. Typical northern sort of market town. And in December 2016, it was actually named Dwarven Capital of the World because of the stories. And I must admit, this totally unofficial title came from THQ Nordic, who is a video game developer. And the Northumberland Gazette, who talked about this, claimed that the idea of dwarves in general came from the Simon Side story and then evolved over the centuries into the ale drinking miners, blacksmiths and warriors that we would know from Tolkien and Disney. I do think we have to be quite wary of this claim because Disney did obviously borrow Snow White from the fairy tale collected by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. And they published that in 1812 as part of their nursery and household tales collection. And obviously this is the kind of thing that we're more familiar with, I think, with dwarves now. And given the Brothers Grimm collected their original stories in what is now Germany, it is hard to know how old the dwarves in their tale might be. And the fact that their name Durgar is similar to the old Norse word Durgar, it could indicate a shared Germanic origin. And an article on dwarves in the Chronicle certainly makes this link in 1894, calling the dwarvish elves or demons close relations of the Norse Durgar. And it's entirely possible that they're actually just a distant branch of the family and the, the Germanic ones are more, more keen to help a lost child in the forest rather than luring people to the death on a moor. And let's be honest, like we've all got like those family members that we wish we didn't. So it would be kind of fair enough if the dwarves had the same problem. But it does also remind us how sanitised a lot of fairy tales have become over the years because we're not really sure that Disney would have made Snow White 
if he thought for one minute that Happy might suddenly decide to have Snow White for lunch instead. So we do have to wonder, has the cautionary aspect of these tales been lost over the years, which I, I suspect that they have been. But I think uh, before we switch into the next bit, which is a little bit less bloodthirsty and more mischievous, then it might be quite a good idea for like a five minute break. Um, so I'll just stop sharing there. Are there any questions? Um, so we're going to move on because um, that's all the kind of the bloodthirsty stuff first. Um, so we're going to move on to um, sprites and fairies next. And then we've got like some magical beings at the end. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to fit it all in. Um, so we are going to have a look at, um, why is this not moving there? At sprites. Now these are at like, this is kind of the, the thing that the, the Victorians in particular have done with sprites and fairies. They've made them seem really cute and twee. Um, but we've also got some really quite mischievous ones as well. So the first type of um, sprite that we're going to have a look at is called a silky. And they're so named because they announce their presence with a sound like the rustle of silk. And sometimes it refers to the ghost of a woman who died in an unfortunate way. But in other cases, the silky spirit is basically a little bit more like uh, a brownie and stuff like that. And one particular one, so this is just to give you an idea where stuff is in relation to Newcastle. So obviously I put the arrow on the point like that's Newcastle. Um, and I'm sort of north of that. Um, but a particularly famous one um, actually plagued the village of Blackheaden near Stamfordham, which is over there. And in the and this is from the closing years of the 18th century. So this one, uh, there obviously are tales of it that are kind of like uh, tied to a specific period of time. And it was her favourite trick uh, to apparently just appear out of nowhere to travellers on lonely or dark stretches of the road. And then what she would do is if you were on horseback, she would then appear on the horse behind you and she'd sort of rustle her silks and then she would just disappear again after a certain distance. So she's a little bit like an early example of the Phantom Hitchhiker uh, from Urban Legends, but she doesn't actually waste any time flagging anyone down. Um, so that's it. it's, it's not harmful. I mean, it might give you a bit of a fright, but she's not like, you know, the Simon Side Dwarves wanting to lure you for dinner or anything. She's just kind of having having a bit of a joke at your expense, really. Um, and then she also appears here at Belsay, which is a few miles away from Blackheaden. Also, incidentally, Belsay Hall Castle and Gardens that you can hopefully see on that map. If you're ever in this neck of the woods, it's absolutely worth visiting. And there's a tree studded crag nearby, um, probably on the lands of Belsay Hall now, I think. And here there's a waterfall that pours out um, of a lake beside the crag. And then there's this old oak tree that overlooks it. And people thought that the arrangement of branches made it look a little bit like a chair. And they thought that they could hear Silky sitting there on wild, windy nights. And because of that, it became known as Silky's chair. Now, our antics did sometimes verge on the annoying rather than confusing. And she would take quite great delight in freezing horses at work. So if she got them under her control, they wouldn't move an inch until she let them go. And on one occasion, a wagon driver was trying to deliver coal and he could not get the horses to spur on at all. And a servant at a nearby farm basically had to come out with a branch of rowan and then the horse sort of like moved on again when they touched the horse with the rowan. And speaking of which, because this is quite common to the whole country, um, but, and I found these in the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh, and this is the kind of thing that people would make to deter things like the silky. So they're just little bits of uh, rowan twig that you would bind together with red thread, and this would ward off both fairies and witches. And rowan often appears in folklore as the only way to disenchant someone or something under the power of the fairies, as the horses clearly were. In this particular case, apparently the guy with the cart with the horses wouldn't actually leave home again without having um, a branch of rowan in his, in his cart so we could solve the problem again if it happened, which I don't know if it did, but at least he sort of like learned the quite easy way of sorting it out. Silky does also, as I said before, bear some resemblance to brownies. So if someone left their house untidy, Silky would actually then set everything to right overnight. Now, I don't see that as a bad thing, perhaps. I sort of think, yep, where can I get one of these from? But if someone had tidied and cleaned, she would then turn everything upside down in the night so that they woke up to chaos. So unless you liked having her tidy up for you, which to be fair, I think like 
most of us would probably quite like that. Um, if you wanted her to leave, you could leave out a dish of cream for her and she'd accept it as payment for like services rendered and then she would leave. So if you if you liked her cleaning for you, you'd obviously not do that. Um, but otherwise you could get it leave actually quite easily. And this is um, the, the more traditional uh, image of the brownie. Um, and Arthur Rackham, I think, inadvertently became the Folklore Thursday like official artist because we use his work so often. But the... There is another type of uh, mischievous imp in these parts known as a dunny, who's also classified as a brownie, hence the reason why I've got the image there. And he quite uh, liked playing tricks on people. And he's particularly fond of shape shifting. So one of his favorite ones, and this, you'd, you, this is annoying, this would really, really irritate you, but he would wait until a farmer needed a midwife for the delivery of one of his kids. And the dunny would take the form of his horse, and then he would take the farmer all the way to the midwife's house and then carry the farmer and the midwife back to the farmer's house. But then on the way back, the dunny would wait until they'd reached the muddiest part of the road and would then just vanish. So that would then leave the midwife and the farmer stuck in the mud and struggling to trudge back to the house. Obviously, if you're trying to go and like deliver somebody's child in an era of very rudimentary healthcare, that would be actually quite a dangerous thing to do. The other thing that he would do was he would take the form of a ploughman's horse so the ploughman would then catch what he thought was his horse in the field, bring him home, put him in the harness and everything, only to see the horse vanish and the harness hit the floor. And then you need to go all the way back to the field to go and fetch the real horse. And the dunny, um, the dunny is the interesting one because while he's considered to be a brownie, he was apparently seen among the Cheviot Hills and he was repeating this verse over and over, which is, cock and hoof, there's gear enough, collier hoof, there's mare, for I've lost the key of the bounders and I'm ruined forever mare. And obviously you can probably, uh, for this one, it's basically the fact he's lost the key and because of that he's now ruined. And some people actually think that he was the ghost of a reaver and he'd hidden his loot in the hills. And in this particular thing, what he'd lost the key for was basically he'd lost where he'd left the treasure. And I'm not entirely convinced by how a reaver ghost would then gain the ability to shapeshift into different animals. So I can't help thinking that the ghost story of the reaver and the legends of the dunny have somehow become fused over time. Um, but there are parts in the, the Cheviots where, which are all like, oh, that's dunny's seat and that's dunny's this. And so the Cheviots are actually quite, quite strongly linked uh, with this. And the reavers are an interesting thing. I, I don't even have time to get into, but I, I the idea of linking them with with brownies to me just sort of shows how somebody's possibly confused the two when they maybe shouldn't have been. But there we go. And we're now going to look at another creature that's not quite a sprite, but it's also not as demonic as some would suggest. And that's why I'm putting it among these strange beings. And that's the bar guest. Now, clearly, I couldn't find a picture of one because, you know, people didn't have cameras. So I just made an image of one. So this is a uh, a black uh, Belgian shepherd that I photoshopped his eyes. And the bar guest is most often associated with the folklore of Yorkshire, but the tales do extend up into Northumberland, which is why I've included them here. And he is sometimes referred to as the pad foot. And I think as much as I don't want to give JK Rowling any more airtime than she's already had, because, you know, reasons. Um, at the same time, you can obviously guess where she got pad foot from uh, for or whichever one of them it is. I think it might be Sirius um, is his nickname. And Henderson does actually look at the name bar guest to give some explanations for where its name came from. And he thought it might come from Burgest, meaning town ghost, or it might come from the German Bargeist or spirit of the funeral buyer. And it's apparently part of the goblin family, although it doesn't really have anything in common with other things that we're used to with goblins. But the bar guest had massive teeth and claws, fiery eyes, hence the red-eyed dog here. And he was only ever seen at night. And if you saw one, it meant that you would die soon afterwards. So which would obviously explain its funereal name. Some believed it was actually invisible. So how people knew what it looked like is beyond me. But you would know it was around because you would hear rattling chains. So again, that's a really weird con sort of, you know, putting together of um, more traditional sort of ghostly apparitions and death omens, but 
There we go. It wasn't just a death omen for you. It would also foretell the deaths of others. And if you saw one lying down across the threshold of someone's house, it meant that someone within the house would soon die. Of course, because folklore is one of the most contradictory things that you can ever look at. And it is kind of annoying after a while because there's no like definitive story. There is also a version of the bar guest that he only appeared after the passing of a notable person. And this would be worth seeing. But if this happened, he, the bar guest would then lead all the local dogs in a weird kind of procession sort of through the town. And they'd all be howling and barking as they did so, kind of to like pay their respects to the person who died. And if you try to stop them, the bar guest would essentially smack you with his paw and then leave behind a, a wound that wouldn't heal. And the bar guest is it's more of a general type of story. So it's a creature that people believed in, in the sense of like, oh, you, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that kind of thing, rather than there being like a specific legend of a specific person or time attached to it. But I do think it's quite interesting how much he then differs from the traditional black dog and black shuck stories that you get in the south of the country. So I thought I'd put him in anyway, because bar guests are quite interesting. Um, and I quite... I, I do question the describing him as a death omen, uh, as a, uh, a goblin, because as I say, he's more of a death omen. So he's kind of a little bit like the banshee of, uh, of Irish myth. But we are going to move on um, as like a bit, again, a bit of a segue to fairies, because there are so many fairy stories in Northumberland, and they're not the cute and fluffy fairies of these kind of Victorian images that you get, or indeed Disney, because it's kind of irritating to anyone who's ever actually read like fairy lore, that they are quite dangerous. You do not want to be expecting them to cast wishes and do things like that. They don't just pop up and make your life better because they want to be kind because they will expect repayment and it's a probably a far more vicious type than you would like it to be. And generally, in a lot of the legends, the fairies exist in this place called the Otherworld, which is this shadowy realm on, on the borders of our own. So it's hardly surprising that if they live in this sort of shadowy realm, that they would prefer the liminal spaces of the lands along the borders. And the first two stories uh, were related by Emmy uh, Richardson in his table book. And the, the bo I think both of them um, happened around the area of Elsdon, which which is just again on the edge of the Northumberland National Park. And um, so I've seen marked that there for you. So it's kind of west of Morpeth, which is like the, the nearest sort of market town. But basically, according to Richardson, a few centuries prior to him writing his table book, there was a midwife who lived near Elsdon and she was known locally as Howdy. And people knew of her skills for miles around, so she was never wanting for work. And one night a messenger turned up on horseback and woke her up and his mistress needed her urgent assistance. Would she come and help? Obviously, Howdy's like, yeah, no problem. This is my job. This is what I do. Crack on. Um, but the, me the messenger said, well, can you, do you mind awfully wearing this blindfold um, on the journey? And Howdy was like, yeah, okay. Because he knew, she knew that lords sometimes got servants into trouble if you catch my drift. So she thought, fair enough, maybe discretion is required here, but I'm going to get paid, so never mind. So she's like, yeah, no problem. And she obviously couldn't guess what was going to happen instead. So she puts the blindfold on, gets whisked away on horseback. And at the end of this journey, she's then led into a cottage and she takes the blindfold off and there's a beautiful woman lying on a bed in a warm but very unfamiliar room. And this is the kind of way that these sort of fairies were then uh, portrayed in art of the period. So how he sets aside the blindfold and gets to work because obviously you should, this is her thing. She knows what she's doing. So she delivers the baby. Baby's nice and healthy. Mother's nice and healthy. All's well. And an old woman enters the room and she comes over and she gives Howdy a box of ointment. And she tells Howdy to anoint the baby's eyes with it. But the old woman was very insistent that the ointment should not touch Howdy's eyes at all. And to be fair, like Howdy's already been brought here by blindfold and she's just like, yeah, OK. And, you know, she agrees and anoints the baby's eyes. But then, unfortunately, her own left eye began to water. And you'll know yourself when you get something in your eye, you rub at it without even stopping to think. So she rubs at her eye to try and get rid of whatever's making it water. And the scene changes. So out of one eye, she can still see the cottage and this woman holding a baby and everything's grand. And then out the other she can see the rough stone walls of a cave 
and the beautiful woman and baby are now ugly and misshapen and she's like oh oops I've delivered a fairy child and this is but I think it's fantastic she keeps that composure like most people would completely freak out at that point but not Howdy she's like she's probably seen worse so she's like awesome can I go home now and the messenger takes her home because she's done what she was hired to do. And the fairy father has sent her back with plenty of gold because she'd done as they asked. You know, so as far as they were concerned, baby's healthy, mom's healthy, Howdy's done her job. That should be the end of it. And Howdy thought it would be. So she thought little of it for the, the next few days because she was still busy delivering and caring for newborns in the surrounding area. So everything should have been fine, except eventually she goes to a local market and she sees an old woman or the same old woman stealing butter from each stall. So she's kind of going along, like scraping a little bit off. And Howdy tries to pretend that she hasn't seen her because she's aware that like nobody else in the market is giving this woman any attention whatsoever. So as the, the, the old woman gets closer, she obviously realises that Howdy's spotted her. So she storms up to her. And she goes, which eye can you see me with? And Howdy's like, I can't, I'm, there's no point in lying. So she points to her left eye. And the old woman blows into her face, going, take that. And Howdy then loses the sight in her left eye and remained blind in that eye for the rest of her life because obviously that was the eye that she could see the fairies with. But Howdy wasn't the only health professional to encounter the fairies. And in a lot of ways, Howdy actually gets off quite lightly compared to some of the other ones. But in a similar tale, a country doctor has the same issue. So a strange messenger comes along, says, can you come with me to do this, this particular job? But in this case, the messenger actually asks the doctor to rub this ointment onto his eyes. And the doctor did so. And a magnificent door appeared in the side of a hill. And unlike Howdy, the doctor had already twigged what was going on. And he knew he was about to meet a fairy because who else would live in such a place as this? And he'd heard the stories of fairy took gold. So he's obviously thinking, nice one. This is going to be a lovely payday. Brilliant. So the messenger leads him inside and there's a lavish hall. And the patient's lying on a mound of furs, surrounded by opulence as far as the doctor can see. And he's like, this is amazing, you know, while he's attending to his patient. And this is presumably the kind of uh, scene that might have awaited him. Now, after delivering the baby, he then leaves the hall. And the messenger tells him to anoint his eyes a second time. But this time, the doctor only rubs the ointment onto one eye. And he mimes rubbing it on his other one. Because after having seen such splendour, the doctor wants to be able to enter the fairy world again. But his quest was not to be because a few days later, he's visiting the market in Morpeth and he wants to buy supplies. And the fairy husband's prancing around in front of him, stealing things from the stalls. And the doctor totally forgets that nobody else can see him and then challenges him. And in this case, the fairy blows into his face and strikes the doctor blind in both eyes. Now, there are other tales and also variations of these two from all over the country but in all of them the fairy ointment becomes the key to actually seeing the fairies either in their true form or at all and it's the ointment that both reveals their true form and obviously therefore acts as a way to remove a fairy's glamour and in the original meaning of the word glamour rather than like the way we think of glamour now it meant to bewitch a person so you could adopt a glamour which would fool someone into seeing something or someone else instead and then the ointment gives someone the ability to see through that. The other stories also use the ointment to see the fairies in the first place, which implies that they're invisible to humans. So only the salve can actually give them the ability to see them. And I do think this is a bit of a weird thing with the doctor because he puts it on in order to see them, but then applying more seems to cancel out the effect. But in Howdy's case, it's an accident because she doesn't actually intend to do it herself. But in the, in the doctor's case, he deliberately ignores his instruction. And that's a key point with fairy stories. If they give you instructions, you follow them to the letter. You don't just do your own thing because it never ends well. And the fairies of folklore are very rarely the cuddly and cute variety that, you know, flit around granting wishes and so on. And that act version actually dates again to the Victorian era when they conflated fairies with cherubs and then they became this weird, like delightful creature associated with childhood rather than the good folk who just want nothing to do with you. And obviously earlier centuries, fairies were tricksters and, you know, they had their own agenda and their own way of doing things. And this is obviously, again, um, the kind of thing that people uh, would have in mind in the early 20th century about what the fairy court might look like. But you would basically pray never to encounter them.
And in a lot of cases, fairies might grant you wish, they might bind you into some kind of deal with them, or of course they might steal your child and leave a changeling in its place. So essentially you're better off keeping out of their way. And this incidentally actually marks the theme of our third story. And that's actually the fairy's attitude towards people and particularly the construction of Kalali Castle. Now Kalali Castle actually stands around nine miles west of Anik and it's been converted into private apartments so there's no public access. But in 2015, the North Wing was actually on the market for £485,000. Uh, and I've missed that image. Uh, but that, again, fairies banquet. It all looks rather lovely, but I wouldn't want to come across that. But this is Kalali Castle. Um, and the thing is, as I say, the North Wing for £485,000, you're essentially getting a three bedroom house for that. It's, it's not value for money, really. I mean, it looks nice, but the upkeep would be horrible. But anyway... The castle itself features quite an odd history and the fairy folk do make an appearance in the story of its foundations because near the main building lies an Iron Age hill fort and Kalali Castle originally started out as a peel tower and they're essentially like quite small uh, but defensible towers and it was built in the 14th or 15th century and again they're the kind of thing that's easier to defend in the middle of a Viking raid. You can kind of bring everybody in and lock the door and then that's it. And the tower became the west wing of the house built in 1619 by John Clavering. And a lot of these early features have, have disappeared as they've kept adding on to the house. But we're going to go back to the 12th century and, you know, never mind the current one, where Lord and Lady Kalali wanted to build a new castle. And the two of the whole estate and Lord Kalali believed he'd found the ideal spot. And it was on a hill overlooking the village and it would be really easy to defend it in case of an attack by the Scots. Lady Kalali disagreed because it was also really windy up there and she preferred a site in the valley where comfort came before defensibility. They couldn't reach an agreement on this, so Lord Kalali sent for Master James, a highly sought after castle builder. So he looked at the site on the hill and came up with a design that would actually suit both parties. So the location and defences would suit Lord Kalali, but then there were sheltered rooms and a garden for Lady Kalali. So they finally agreed and work began. The sunk foundations all seemed well, but then when the stonemasons and builders began to lay courses for the walls, everything went awry because every morning the team would come back to the site to find everything that they'd done the day before had been completely torn asunder. So they had to start work again every day from scratch. Master James basically got really bored with this and assumed that someone was playing a trick on them. So one night he sent the men home for the day, but he stayed behind hidden on the hill. And the fairies only appeared when the last light was extinguished in the village. So they were basically just tearing up the stones, flinging them around, completely destroying everything that had been done. And as they did so, they were apparently singing a song. Kalali Castle built on a height, up in a day, down in a night. Build it down in the shepherd's shore. It will stand forever and never fall. And they were singing this as they were pulling the thing to bits. So Master James then ran down to Lord Kalali to make his report. And he knew exactly where to find Shepherd's Shore because it was also on the land. And basically it was also kind of where Lady Kalali wanted her castle built. And because he was obviously Lord Kalali fed up with the constant disruption while he's trying to build his castle. So he then decides to build it in Shepherd's Shore instead. But the story doesn't quite end there, obviously, because some people think that Lady Kalali essentially spun this cute story to explain how she got her own way. And I remember hearing a version when I was little where the lady was actually in cahoots with the fairies, so she got them to do this for her. There's another version where she actually dresses a servant up and he pulls the building stones down and then um, people uh, people panic when they see this, this, this creature basically tearing stones to bits. And then he, he shouts this uh, song out and then Lord Kalali decides to obey. So there's all kinds of weird versions where some people think it was torn down by a phantom priest, other people by the fairies and so on. But we can actually look to see if there's any truth in the story through archaeology, because archaeologists arrived on the site to do some exploratory work and they had no interest in the Peel Tower in the valley. They were interested in the hill fort and the locals believed that the hill fort was the site of the unfinished castle. And this is essentially what's left of it. And while they were excavating the hill fort, they discovered the foundations of a stone castle, which dated back to the 12th century. So perhaps the original unfinished castle had been abandoned because of the fairies after all. 
Um, the remains apparently aren't that exceptional and some people think that the unfinished work could be because of the fact that it was obviously expensive or they didn't really need a castle at the time because the Peel Tower is smaller and it would be cheaper and just as easy to live in. Although the foundations of the unfinished castle date to the 12th century and the Peel Tower dates to the 15th century. So why would a family wait 300 years to build their castle? So it's up to you. Um, did the, the castle actually fall foul of the fairies? Did Lady Kalali use her servants and local superstitions to con our husband into choosing her favourite location? Or did they just do their sums and realise that actually they didn't add up, they'd have to build it at some other time instead? Now, I am going to, we've got two more stories um, about um, the fairies. So for the next one, uh, and this one's kind of someone who tried to live peacefully alongside them, which makes a bit of a change. So we are off to Rothley, not Rothbury, which obviously we were earlier, but Rothley, which is near Morpeth. And a miller lived there. And he actually shared the mill house with a family of fairies. And they did the housework and then he would give them some of his grain, which again, I think sounds like a perfectly fair bargain. I'm like, yep, that's absolutely worth it. And Frederick Grice in his Folk Tales of the North Country describes the fairies thus. They were lovely to see, none bigger than daffodils, but beautifully formed, with long flaxen hair flowing over their shoulders. Their mantles were as green as the sycamore buds in March, and each rode on a dapper little horse, cream-coloured like a primrose, and beautifully harnessed. They had saddles, bridles, and reins, all neatly stitched and sewn, and from the harness hung little bells no bigger than a raindrop, and each chiming with a pretty sound. So in this case, the fairies really do sound like the, the kind of thing that we would expect from sort of like a lot of the, the films and, and, and comics and whatnot. So that, that's kind of what you might imagine if you think about fairies. But anyway, John Hodgson actually claims in his History of Northumberland that the family were actually none other than Queen Mab herself and her court. And he actually claimed that the family would bathe in the nearby river. I have problems with that because I can't quite see Mab lowering herself to do the housework for somebody else. But there we go. The fairies would cook their porridge in the kiln that the, mill, the miller used to dry his grain. And occasionally they would stir the fire to give more heat to the porridge, but then that would burn the grain. And obviously the miller found that annoying because he couldn't sell the ruined grain. But by and large, the arrangement was a happy one. And this, this is the kind of thing I always imagine them having like a, a little knees up um, every evening. And everything was fine until a second fairy family moved in. And the fairies still finished the housework, but they were taking twice as much grain. And obviously they were also burning twice as much grain in the kiln. So the miller completely grew impatient with this. And one night he found the grain burning in the kiln again. And he completely lost his temper and threw a clod of earth into the fire. And hot cinders and porridge splattered the hungry fairies who were waiting near the pot. So the cry went up, burnt and scalded. Now, at this point, the miller realises his mistake because he's actually injured the fairies and then he turns to run. But one of the fairies caught up with him and grabbed his ankle. And at this point, the miller did what I think most people would do and he fainted. When he woke up, the Rothley fairies were gone and his entire leg was now paralysed and he never regained its use. I'm presuming that he still continued to be a miller. That bit's kind of, I'm not really sure what the ending of the story was. But either way, the, the, the domestic bliss that he'd managed to achieve with them essentially was no more. And elsewhere in the area, another small family risked the wrath of the Rothley fairies, but this time they actually survived because a little boy actually manages to outwit the fairies, which is why I've included it, because it's quite unusual. So a widow and her young son are living in a cottage near the village. And one night, a child refused to go to bed. And the tired mother's like, you know what, fine, stay up. But if you do, the fairies will come for you if you stay up by yourself. And obviously, bear in mind, this is at a time when people actually believed in changelings or fairies doing ill by them. So obviously, this is what's going on. So the widow is just like, yeah, whatever, stay downstairs. And she goes up to bed and the boy stays downstairs. And then soon after, a doll like figure comes down the chimney and she's quite friendly and you know, obviously quite pleased to see him. And this totally disarms the boy and he overcomes his fright. And maybe he's lonely, maybe he wants friends his own age, we don't know. But either way, he asks her what her name was. And she says she's called Ainsel, and you. So he then replies and goes, my Ainsel, with a smirk. And we can only assume that he's basically at the age where echoing people's like the height of comedy. Now, I always like to imagine it looks a bit like this. This isn't actually of the story, I just think it illustrates it quite well. So 
they're playing together downstairs everything's fine everything seems to be going well and then the fire starts to die down so the boy picks up the poker like he's seen his mother do so many times before and stirs the cinders but unfortunately a scattering of hot ash falls out of the grate and onto Ansel's foot she understandably I think roars in pain and the boy flees in terror because he's barely hidden in bed when the door flies open downstairs and he's like oh god I'm in for it now so the furious mother of this fairy comes in shouting who's done this so the fairy then starts crying and she says my insult which obviously she's saying what she thinks is the boy's name but what she's actually saying is my own self so the mother's like well fair enough then you you, you can only blame yourself then if you've done it yourself so she kicks her daughter up the chimney and i'm sure that the young boy sighs of or breathes a sigh of relief that his verbal trick has paid off and the story doesn't expand on whether they spend any more time together after that, but it's unlikely. But at least the boy repeating her name back to her and the fact the story only works because she's called Ansel as an own self. Um, at least it does mean that he manages to escape any punishment. I mean, it was just an accident, but still, um, he, 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 I think he's quite lucky with that one. And many of our folk tales and legends really do explore the darker side of the fairy folk. So you can only imagine what would this fairy's mother actually have done to him. But the ultimate moral is always the same. If you treat the fairies with respect, um, it's kind of the only way to avoid their wrath. But if you can, just don't deal with them at all. And do bear this in mind that these stories do have a bit of a historical precedent because the date to a time when being charitable and helpful to your neighbours was actually expected as the normal behaviour of a Christian. So if you uh, sort of turned away somebody in need, you might be slighting a fairy, hence bad consequences, but you were also then being a bad Christian as well. Um, now, obviously bear in mind in the stories that both the miller and the boy know that the fairies are real. Uh, and obviously they both injure the fairies by accident and through temper. Um, but it does kind of make you think that really work with your fairy neighbors is a good way to stay on their good side rather than annoying them because who knows what might happen. Although in our next story, and then we'll have another break, you will see that if you can't sort of avoid them, you could always work with them instead. And we are going to go and meet um, Thomas the Rhymer. And he, so far we've looked at the negative interactions between humans and fairies, but in this case, it actually works out for the better. And um, this is where he is roughly from. So again, it's up by Melrose, where we looked at before for the vampire. And... There is some basis in fact in this one because some versions of the story call him Thomas Remo de Urseldoon or Thomas Leamont. Um, but many people do agree that the real Thomas was actually born somewhere around 1220. And he does pop up in a charter from 1260 to 80. And then there's also another version that might be him from 1294. So at least there's a few historical people that we can actually tie this story to. And basically, whoever this version was, Thomas enjoyed walking in the countryside of the Scottish borders. And according to the legend, he often sat under a particular tree, which many people believe was a hawthorn. And single hawthorn trees nearly always act as a gateway to fairyland. And this is believed to be the site of the tree. So there's actually a stone to mark it. And there are a whole range of superstitions around hawthorn trees and so on. But we are just going to think about them as you know, the gateway to fairyland. So he's sitting under his hawthorn one day and he sees the Queen of Elfland or the Queen of the Fairies riding by on her white horse. Some people say that he met her while he was falling asleep and other people think he was just enjoying the view while she rides past. But the first point is that the Queen of the Fairies is not Titania. That was Shakespeare's invention. So uh, there's no reference to her um, in traditional folklore as being called Titania and also a lot of people call her Mab but there's not actually any evidence that the fairy queen ever had a name that that sort of comes a little bit more from some of the Arthurian stuff so um, traditional folklore doesn't actually tell us what she's called uh, she's just the queen of the fairies and my theory is that no one knows her name just because she never told anyone um, so if you think about Rumpelstiltskin knowing someone's name gives you power over them so if you don't if you only know her by her title then, you know, you can't make her do anything she doesn't want to do because she's queen. But anyway, um, so here's their meeting. So you do you do get some uh, images of this in, in art and so on. And the stories do vary because they always do at this point. But the common factor is Thomas basically then goes with the queen to fairyland. And he basically agrees to stay for seven years acting as her servant. 
um, there's only one condition that's attached and that while he's there, he cannot speak. If he does, he'll be stuck in Fairyland forever. Now, some people think that he had to keep quiet about their relationship so that the Fairy King didn't find out. Other people think that he couldn't speak at all. But either way, it's, it's, it's similar to a lot of stories that you get about both Fairyland and the Underworld, that if you eat anything from that realm, you'll be trapped there. In this case, he can't speak. So he almost kind of can't leave tr even verbal traces of himself. And either way, he becomes the Queen's servant. And true to form, she does release him from the bargain. So he goes back to real life after seven years. But when he does, he possesses the ability to tell the future. So some people think that in one version of the story, um, the Queen gives him an apple as wages for the, the seven years. And then when he eats it, it gives him the tongue that cannot lie. That's one version. Um, and then in other, uh, other versions of the story, people think that he, he, he returned to the world, but he could only tell the truth. Um, which kind of makes me think a bit of Liar Liar, and which I, I don't quite think a Jim Carrey film is really based on Thomas the Rhymer, but I quite like to think it might be in some shape or form. And in other tales, he basically starts issuing prophecies and then becomes a celebrity when they start coming true. Um, and then he allegedly disappears into the forest one day and is never seen again. And in this, these stories, people think he actually just returned to fairyland. And this is the kind of like map that people would make of what fairyland actually looked like, um, which is quite impressive. Now, the earliest known version of the story dates to just before the mid 15th century and the part of the story, including uh, fairyland or elfland, whichever version you want to call it, comes from the Ballad of Thomas the Rhymer. And scholars think that that actually goes back to the late 13th century, which would put it into Thomas Learmont's lifetime. So that's where some people think it may have some element of truth to it. And three more followed, although they all talk about an older story. And some people think that Thomas himself actually wrote the first version as an autobiography, but no one's ever found any copies of it. And Sir Walter Scott was the one who made the story famous because he basically went around collecting stories from the Scottish borders in order to preserve them so that they weren't lost. So he made quite a lot of stories and folklore famous. And it was kind of almost a way of like preserving Scottish identity as well. So Scott did have an ulterior motive, but it was also really helpful for folklorists that he did so. And Scott even bought the land where Thomas apparently met the fairy queen because Scott really identified with Thomas. So you'd also have to question how objective his poem would be, just saying. But many people do believe that the special gift from the fairies was what explained his ability to predict key events in Scottish history. So some people then take it further and turn him into a king in the hill figure. And we're going to look into that a little bit more uh, later on. But generally, this is somebody who returns when a country needs them. And in Thomas's case, he returns when Scotland needs him. So people who say that you went to fairyland think he'll come back at some point. So are his predictions true? Yes and no. If you spout enough stuff, eventually some of it is going to come true. I mean, look at Nostradamus. I can't help thinking a prediction is only really useful if it makes sense before the event. Because if you, if you can only go after the event, ah, he said that was going to happen. Well, that's not very useful if you can't change the course of events. So these are some of the things that these prophecies apparently actually predicted. Um, so they appear to come true. So he's got King Alexander III's death in 1286, the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314 and the, the Scottish victory of said battle, Robert the Bruce's ascension to the throne, the defeat of King James IV at Flodden in 1513, Flodden actually being in Northumberland, and Mary Queen of Scots's defeat in 1567. So the problem is people who were associated with the predictions did kind of that if they, they link themselves to them, which then lent the predictions weight. And obviously if someone goes, oh, I'm supposed to be king because I, I, it was prophesied that I would do so. Obviously it's like amazing PR in a lot of words. And we all know what leaders are like when they start spouting nonsense. So it's, it's difficult to know if the, the, the prophecies are actually just political hogwash rather than actual predictions. And without the prophecies, to be fair, like Thomas the Rhymer would have been just another person who claimed to have been taken by the fairies. And women who were tortured for information during the witchcraft trials actually gave really similar accounts to Thomas's. The difference is they weren't lauded as prophets or treated as a political advisor. 
obviously the big difference is the fact that they were women and therefore considered to be more susceptible to diabolical influence uh, and their predictions people didn't believe they were accurate even if they did make them now by the time you get to the witchcraft trials the story was already around 400 years old so obviously people had changed their view of witchcraft and fairies by then um but ultimately like thomas around i think has sort of disappeared from history a little bit so whether he would return to save Scotland and anyone would notice or not, I don't know. Um, Cause it might be like, who are you? <laughs> but, um, and who's to say that he hasn't already come back um, and, and nobody noticed, um, or he may, he may yet have to come back. We don't know. Um, but he's, he's quite an interesting figure in a lot of ways. Um, and I thought he was quite a nice way to tie up the fact that you could actually have dealings with the fairies that didn't need you like blind or maimed in some way. <laughs> because that's quite unusual. Um, I'll stop there for a short break, though, if anyone wants uh, tea breaks or toilet or questions or anything. Um, and, uh, and then obviously what again is because, like, I love all the, the things where people go on about, like, you know, Game of Thrones and stuff. And, and it's like, yeah, the, the Westeros pretty much could be like the north of England. Uh, so we do have dragon stories as well. Um, then there, and there are actually, I should point out, there are dragon stories from all over the British Isles. Um, some of them are more like wyverns, which are like, if you imagine a dragon, but without front legs, it's just got the wings. And then you also get the like the smog type dragons as well. Um, but in this part of the country, they're known as worms um, or worms, depending on where you are. Um, the Lambton worm is probably the most famous one from County Durham. Um, but obviously that's too far south for our purposes. So we're going to look at the story of the Laidley Worm um, from Spindlestone Hugh, and that's near Barnborough Castle. If anyone has seen the Michael Fassbender's version of Macbeth, every time you see the exterior shots of Macbeth's castle, that's actually Bam. Oh dear. Yeah, you do get worms all over um, all over the country. So you, as I say, you've got the wyverns, which is, is if you imagine a traditional dragon, as I say, but with no front legs, and it's just got its back legs uh, and, and wings. And then you've got the big smoke type ones as well, but they tend to be more down south. Um, so ours are the worms or worms, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And you might have heard of the Lambton worm from County Durham, but we're looking at the Laidley worm, which is from near Bambra. And I don't know if anyone heard this bit or not, but it was used for the exterior shots in Michael Fassbender's Macbeth. So it is it is a pretty impressive uh, place to be. And we're, I, I can't say when this story is set because nobody really knows. Um, but the tale does concern Princess Margaret, who uh, her mother has died. Her brother then goes off looking to seek his fortune in distant lands and his father, uh, her father rather, then goes around the country looking for a new bride. So Margaret's basically alone in Barnborough Castle, uh, waiting for him to come back. Eventually, he comes back with this new wife in tow, and um, the, 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 whole, the local population turn out, and they're like, oh, great, we get to see uh, the new queen, and they have this lavish feast to welcome her to the area. But unfortunately for Margaret, the new queen is actually a witch, and she's immediately jealous of Margaret's beauty and popularity. So she, and for some weird reason, which seems like a really odd thing to do at like your like homecoming festival, um, the queen then curses Margaret to turn into a ladly worm uh, publicly, uh, which could only be broken by the return of her brother. Margaret's like, yeah, whatever, and completely dismisses the threat and goes off to bed. She does start a thing, hmm, I'm not really sure what's going on here, and obviously takes her a while to get to sleep that night, but eventually she does doze off. And then in the morning, none of the servants can find Margaret because instead her room houses a mighty dragon instead of the princess. And apparently the curse had come true. Now the worm, rather than going on some kind of like servant eating rampage, actually leaves the castle and takes refuge in the nearby caves. And one old ballad said that she was so venomous that no grass or corn could grow in a seven mile radius. Now the local populace didn't know what to do to save their livestock from the beast because True to form, really, for Margaret's character, she would rather eat their animals than them. So eventually they consult a warlock and he says you need to leave the milk of seven cows in a stone trough 
and then that will stop the dragon from eating your animals. And it did. It placated her and it stopped her bothering their animals. And there, there is, it's quite strange because while the cave and the trough were actually destroyed to make way for a quarry, this is actually where they believe both of those things were once found. So it's quite cool that it can actually be tied to the local landscape. Now, as you might imagine, news of the worm then spread far and wide, and eventually the story reached Margaret's brother, Child Wind. And the prince is obviously furious to hear about what's happened to his sister at the hands of his new stepmother, who he hasn't met yet. So he then sets sail for Bamborough Castle, and he knows all about witches. So the clever lad has a ship made from Roan wood. So we're back to Roan again. And although nobody had really thought to hold the queen to account for her public curse and its effects, basically it's then left to Child Wind to sort it out when he gets back. So he ships approaching the, co the coast and in some versions of the story, the queen actually calls up this really fearsome storm to hold off his approach. And in other versions, the Laidly Worm lashes its tail and whips the sea into a frenzy. So either way, Child Wind can't land at the beach at Bambrett, so instead he lands at Budel Bay, which isn't that far away. But he runs up the beach and the Laidly Worm rears up behind the cliffs. And Child Wind is like, this might not go well because he's obviously afraid of the mighty dragon, but he also wants to save his sister and isn't 100% sure how. So he raises his sword and then he hears his sister's voice. And she tells him to put away his blade and to give the dragon three kisses. Child Wind goes, oh, okay, obeys, and then the lady worm disappears, replaced instead by his sister. And that's one of the images um, that we often see where she's kind of changing back out of the form of the dragon. And that's from 1895. And the siblings then set off for Barnborough Castle with Child Wind eager to bring the Queen to justice. And then when they reach the castle, the Queen realises that she's rather underestimated this pair and begs them for mercy. Now, some of the stories say that Margaret is quite sweet natured, though a little bit naive, and she's actually quite happy to oblige. But Child Wind's like, no, I'm not going to forgive that. You turn my sister into a dragon. And he then condemns the Queen to the same fate that she'd meted out to his sister. The queen vanishes in a puff of smoke and leaves behind a large venomous toad. And the, cha the servants actually then chase the beast out of the castle and it hides at the bottom of the castle well. There is another version of the story where Child Wind actually touches the queen with Rowan and then she shrivels up and becomes the toad and flees. And then there are local legends that actually tell of a foul toad ha uh, haunting the area. Now, we don't know how true the legend is. It is similar to other ballads of the time. And it is quite difficult to actually place it in a specific area. And it's entirely possible that it dates to a time of calamity. So if you've then got a newcomer suddenly arrives and everything goes wrong, you might then suddenly go, ooh, witchcraft, that's obviously to blame. And the strange form of the, the worm itself, which is like a long sinuous snake-like beast, does echo the great serpents that would adorn Viking longships. And I was wondering if they're actually a folkloric descendant of Jormungand, who encircles Midgard until Ragnarok, and that is actually who um, that is in that image from the 17th century. Now, I should also point out that the king in the story is never actually named, so some historians think that he may have been Ida the Flamethrower, which is an absolutely amazing name, but he's also the first English king, and he ruled from 547 to 560 AD, and other people think that it might actually be a Saxon story or it's a later ballad that's basically had the names and places changed. And the Reverend Robert Lamb uh, Lambert of Norham actually claimed he'd found the story in a 13th century poem, but no records of such a ballad actually survived. So some people think that the Reverend actually wrote it himself and then tried to pretend that he'd found it anyway. Either way, it is quite a fitting fairy tale for such a forbidding fortress. And I think it really kind of suits the area quite well but I mean you can see on the left there the way that they draw the dragon is actually remarkably similar to the depiction of Jormungand um, on the right there but we are we are basically going to go from uh, dragons to wizards because why not and we're essentially going from a forbidden fortress to another equally impressive site for such a tale so we're now going to Tynemouth so that shows you where Newcastle uh, is obviously the city is if you're not familiar and then obviously time out, out at the coast because like to be fair like northerners are really good at naming things really literally so time out is at the mouth of the tyne like 
we've got a street called the side because it runs down the side of the castle like it's amazing some of the street names that we have we've got the west road because it's the road that goes west it's amazing um but we're going to look at time mouse castle and priory and they basically stand on this promontory that sort of sticks out into this rather savage north sea and there is actually a legend that claims there's a wizard's cave hidden in the cliffs below the ruins and this is the cliffs and obviously you can just about see bits of the priory there and the caves apparently somewhere in that cliff and scholars believe that edwin of northumbria founded timemouth priory in the early 7th century and tales abound of ghostly monks loitering among the ruins and there are legends of like underground passages like you'd imagine there would be under an ancient priory or there might be dungeons or something like that and among this network, there's a cave which has the really unfortunate name of Jingling Georgie's Hole. Um, it's also known as Jingling Man's Hole or the Wizard's Cave. I, you can probably guess which one of those I actually like the best. But the entrance apparently lies at the north side of the Priory. So it's in this side of the cliff that you're looking at now, facing King Edward's Bay, which is the beach at the bottom there. And some people believe that a wizard or an old man lived in the cave and he would make strange clanking noises at night when he would then come out in probably area. And other historians think that Jingling Geordie was actually a 17th century smuggler and a pirate. And he basically used that cave as a lookout for uh, incoming ships and he would still had fetters on his legs. So that's why, why you have the jingling is actually the rattling chains. And basically they think that the story might've been put about by him to stop people using his lookout as well. But anyway, long before Jingling Geordie came along, there was apparently a famous and brave knight named Walter the Bold who travelled to Tynemouth. And he'd heard the stories about this mysterious cave full of treasure, but it was apparently guarded by dragons and demons. And the cave apparently had an arched doorway that led to two chambers. And one of them had a hole that was 12 foot deep that then led to two small vaults. So King Arthur climbs down to the cave during the night, which immediately sounds like a really bad idea. And he's armed with a sword and a lamp. And he pushes his way in and he's attacked by demons and other inhuman spirits from all sides. But he strikes out with his sword and pushes his way further into the wizard's cave. And he basically gets to this 12 foot hole and he's like, can I actually make the jump across it? So he takes off his heavier armour. And I always think when I read this story, like are the demons just waiting patiently while he's taking all of his armour off? Or are they helping? Who knows? But either way, he's, he, he says a quick prayer and leaps across the gap. And he does manage to scrabble to safety on the far side, leaving the demon stuck behind him. So he follows the passage, gets to a huge door, and there's a bugle hanging on a golden chain beside it. So he picks it up and he blows three long blasts on the bugle. And somewhere in the depths of this complex where he's found himself, a magical cock crowed and the door swings open. And beyond the door lies a vast chamber. And apparently there's 12 golden lamps hanging on 12 crystal pillars and piles of gold, silver and precious gems are all like lying there, gleaming at them. And... It may not be sung what treasures were seen, gold heaped upon gold and emeralds green, and diamonds and rubies and sapphires untold rewarded the courage of Walter the Bold. And that's like the, the little rhyme that goes with the story. Now, the legend doesn't explain at any point how he actually gets back out or how he takes the treasure across this 12 foot hole. But either way, he apparently manages to do both of those things and becomes a rich lord. And according to the legend, he owns 100 castles. And I'm like, I don't even know if there would be 100 castles in, in, uh, in the country for him to own, but whatever. And he runs of, uh, all of their vast estates and he founds a monastery and marries a beautiful princess. Or does he? Other legends say that this is all nonsense and that the caves were actually haunted and they were filled with the sounds of moans and chains being dragged. And then other people think that the whole supernatural show was intended to frighten people off so that they wouldn't follow Walter's example. Maybe Walter didn't make it out alive and it's actually him making all these unholy sounds. Personally, I like the idea that it's just Jingling Geordie telling people the story to scare them away from his favorite lookout spot. Now, a landslip did actually destroy the cave's entrance in the 1880s. Some people believe that the treasure is still in there under Timemouth Castle. And while I was researching this, I did find conflicting articles saying that you could still get into the entrance of the cave but then you can't get any further because of a cave in. And then other people say that you can get in, but then you will be cut off at high tide. 
obviously me being me a friend and I were actually going to go and have a look but then she needed to have a hip replacement and we never got around to it so one of these days I will go and see if you can actually find the cave at least um if you are in the area though and you do want to go and have a look at Timeout Priory I would recommend it if only to see the beautiful oratory chapel which is kind of part of the only bit of it that's really left standing uh, so it is definitely worth a look now, we can't talk about wizards and not think about uh, Merlin, because obviously the most famous wizard probably ever, which does lead us on to King Arthur. And basically, everywhere in the country seems to have someone going, this is where Camelot was, and Northumberland is no different. We have Sewing Shields Castle, which is a candidate for the true location of Camelot. And in the folklore, basically the way that it works is King Arthur and his court are sleeping somewhere wherever this is and if you can wake them up they'll come back and save England if the, if England's in peril so that would be a really useful thing for somebody to do right now I think and this is where Sewing Shields Crags is so it's literally along the line of uh, Hadrian's Wall and we do have you, you might see that there's a place there called the Twice Brood Inn we do also have a village called Once Brood because again we have weird place names here in the northeast, and um, this is what Sewing Shields Crags actually looks like. So again, it's that same desolate, bleak kind of just amazing um, sort of like landscape. And this is, as I say, it's the King in the Mountain story with the idea that there's a hero who's waiting for the day that he's going to be called forth to come and help his help his people. Um, and, uh, and, and save Britain in, in uh, Britain's darkest hour. And basically, um, this uh, obviously inspired quite a lot of artists. We've got Edward Byrne Jones, the pre Raphaelite, who did this version. And Avalon is, is supposed to be where Arthur's sleeping. And Avalon's location basically changes depending on the stories. And there was a huge fascination with the pre-Raphaelites and King Arthur because of his chivalry and moral fervour. So you can see why people would like the idea that King Arthur's like sleeping somewhere and is ready to come back. But we're going to have a look at Sewing Shields Castle. So this is how the story goes. A shepherd is out tending his sheep one day and obviously the, the, the castle's a ruin at this point. And one of his sheep wanders off, uh, which sheep are you know quite wont to do. And the shepherd hurries after it. And in the process of bringing it back, he stumbles across a hidden entrance among the ruins. And being the curious sort, and I must admit, I would probably do the same thing, he descends into the darkness to see where it goes. He finds a passageway and then he follows it into the belly of the hillside. And eventually he emerges in this huge hall lit by a fire of pure white flame. And there's people sort of sleeping on cushions on the floor. Other people are sitting in chairs upright. And there's two particular figures that really fascinate him because they're sleeping on thrones and both of them are wearing crowns. Now, he knew the local tales and he's like, ah, I know who that is. King Arthur and Queen Guinevere, obviously. So he approaches them and then there's a table standing in front of them. And on one side, there's a sword and a garter. And on the other side, there's a hunting horn. And this always reminds me of that bit in any video game where you're just given random stuff and you've got to figure out like how to combine it in order to do something. And um, if you've ever been in like the point and click adventures of the 90s, you'll know what I mean. But this the, the sword of the shepherd looks at the sword, he's like, that's blatant the Excalibur. That's gonna be worth a bit. And he decides he's gonna take it. Because who wouldn't steal from King Arthur? So he pulls the sword from its scabbard. Why he doesn't take the scabbard with him, I don't know. But anyway, and the king stirs as he moves the sword. He sits upright and he opens his eyes. So the shepherd's like, oh, I didn't mean to do that. And he drops Excalibur and it slices through the garter. And then the rest of the knights then stir and they all yawn and stretch. And they're probably a bit sore after centuries of sleep. So he's terrified beyond belief at this point. And the shepherd inexplicably slides Excalibur back into the scabbard and he flees from the chamber but a voice follows him and says oh woe betide the evil day on which this witless white was born who drew the sword the garter cut but never blew the bugle horn so basically he's done half of what he was meant to to wake them up but he's not done the other half so the shepherd goes back to his flock and he's like you know what that was weird I'll just put it out my head I'll pretend it never happened but he can't forget what he's seen and he tries to remember um, 
all the stories that promised that King Arthur would save the nation and bring happiness and prosperity. So he's like, well, I know how to wake him up now. So maybe I could go and have another go. So he tries to find the entrance and he never finds it. And apparently neither has anyone else. There is actually an alternate version in the Denim Tracts, which replaces the shepherd with a farmer. And in this one, and I love this one because I'm a knitter and I know that obviously um, some of you are crafters as well. The farmer's sitting having a break and he's knitting. And I'm like, I love this. And his ball of yarn rolls away from him. And it's why he's actually going to uh, get his ball of yarn that he then finds this fabulous hole. And in this version, the, the, the farmer basically loses all memory of where he was when the story happened. And that's why um, he can't find it either. And then in later years, uh, the wife of a local landowner actually dreamed of treasure within the ruins and she's hired people to look for it, but no treasure ever emerged. So, and obviously this is King Arthur originally getting um, Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake. Now, is this story likely to be true? Well, I don't need to say like biologically, it's unlikely. Um, I don't know how people could survive for so many centuries without any form of sustenance. Although obviously if you've got Merlin on side, who knows? Um, there are links that do place Arthur in Northumberland and one of his battles actually places him in the forest beyond Hadrian's Wall. And then there's another battle that takes place in the City of the Legions, which could be York, Chester or even Carlisle. So it actually doesn't take too much of a stretch to move him to Northumberland. And Rupert Matthews, um, who wrote a fabulous book on mysterious Northumberland, does make the point that most scholars place Arthur at around about 500 AD and his name doesn't appear in contemporary records but then at the same time few few names do people talk about what happened not who did them so it is entirely possible that you know some of the Arthurian legends should actually be in Northumberland um, although in all honesty it's highly unlikely that any of these kings uh, got their mandate to rule from the sword and the stone really and obviously, a lot of people say you should be in Cornwall, should be in Wales. Um, but, you know, unless we actually find Arthur, we won't be able to ask him ourselves, which I think is a bit of a shame. But anyway, we're going to move on to the final uh, part. And this isn't this isn't so much folklore, but it's that weird bit where folklore, and mythology and legend all meet. Um, and I think this is what makes folklore such an interesting and rich thing to look at. Um, and it did, and I thought, you know what, we've just had King Arthur, like, can you top King Arthur? And I would argue, yes. Um, but you've got to be, you've got to really have someone awesome to do it with. So I'm going to choose our locally grown god who's quite mysterious. And there's not a huge amount about him, but I think he's, just, he's really interested in what he represents. And he's called Antinichiticus, and he might sound Roman. Um, but there's no mention of him outside the northeast of England. So it's entirely possible that he is actually um, an indigenous Celtic god that the Romans have adopted. So basically, if you head out of Newcastle, uh, the city centre, on the West Road, as is quite imaginatively titled because it goes west, um, you go through the modern area of Benwell. And the, the Roman name for this area was Condicum, which is why there's a Condicum Road. It was a fort here. And there was, it was actually one of the 13 permanent forts along Hadrian's Wall. And just beyond Condicum Road, to so kind of like um, basically where the Red Arrow is, there's a 1930s housing estate. And the owner of the land uh, in 1862 actually excavated and found a Roman temple, you know, as you do. And I was just saying this to my mum and dad this morning, that when you watch things like Time Team and people find like Roman villas in the back garden and stuff, and you're just like, eh. You know, we found like old farming equipment from the 50s and stuff, and that's about it. But, you know, it's quite nice that Roman ruins are literally just lying around like everywhere. Um, I mean, you can actually walk past bits of the wall in town, which is quite cool. But anyway, the, the key thing of it is the temple uh, actually still survives because they just built the house and they stay around it, which is quite cool. So you can visit. So naturally, I did. And it is really bizarre because like literally all around it are houses and then across the street is like a street full of houses so it's just like on this plot of land in the middle of a housing estate it is really really weird but that is Newcastle for you I mean you, you literally can't move without tripping over something historical um the Society of Antiquaries of Newcastle upon Tyne did remove the original altars so the ones that are there 
at the temple now are actually concrete casts that were put up in the 30s. And the original altars you can actually still visit in the Great North Museum Hancock, so it is worth going and see them. And experts have dated the temple to around about 178 to 180 AD. And cavalry prefect Tinius Longus actually dedicated the altar there to Antinichidicus. So because of the fact he's not mentioned any local deity, and no one really knows what he did, but the word inspirational often appears when people talk about him. And some people think that he was a favorite for interceding in military business. So 10 years long as was dedicating a temple to him because he'd been promoted. So it makes sense that if you want to have a God for military business and you're in a fort, Antinichiticus is a really good uh, you know, chap to choose, shall we say. So this is the actual um, altar itself. And obviously, as I say, it dates to the second century. And they also unearthed the head of a god as well as the altars. And the dig found uh, a lower leg and parts of a forearm. I should point out they're from a statue, not a person. Um, so there is an idea that there must have been a full size statue of Antinichiticus in the temple. Now, if you do see the altars in the Great North Museum, they do point out that given the gods a human form was a Roman thing. And it was really rare in pre Roman Britain. And I know the Celtic gods tended to more take the form of like natural things like clouds or weather and things like that so for them to personify the god they would have to have thought something of them in order to do that and this is what the head of the god looks like um and as i say they did find a similar one at binchester roman fort in county durham they can't name theirs antinichiticus whereas the newcastle one you can because of the fact that there's the uh, temple there but the resemblance is really really uncanny and the artistic style is kind of like classical Roman meets a regional variation. And a coin dedicated, uh, dated to the period of Marcus Aurelius uh, also emerged during the excavation. So that's why they can sort of say, we think it was about this period. And they think that it was actually a fire destroyed the temple in the second century because of evidence of burnt timbers. But anyway, though, we're obviously more interested in the God himself. So you might wonder, well, you know, a, a Roman god with a single temple in the whole of England can't be that important. But I disagree because the style used to carve his statue shows this local willingness to adopt Roman stylings. So it must have been a local who actually made the, the statue because I can't imagine the Roman army bringing sculptors with them. Um, and you do see similar things in like jewellery and stuff as well, where regional makers then adopt Roman influences and kind of make a new style out of it. And also, this is um, the artist's impression of obviously where the temple would have looked like in relation to the fort. And to be fair, having an entire temple, albeit a small one, dedicated to a local deity kind of shows the, the Roman tendency of like turning up in a new place and going, oh, you have gods, so do we, and kind of like almost doing a, a swapsies with them. And the Romans, when they're a pagan civilization anyway, often they would it was a way of kind of ingratiating themselves with the locals that they would kind of share gods and so on so it would make sense that they would come along and go "Ooh, Antinichiticus he's cool and then adopt him as one of their own but they would only do so locally because of the fact that elsewhere they would adopt their own which is a bit like if you ever go to Bath um they created a new version a new whole new goddess because there was the local water goddess Sulis and then they combine it with the Roman goddess Minerva to make Sulis Minerva. So it's, it's, it's a, they haven't combined them with an actual uh, Roman god, because um, surely Mars would have been a really good one. They actually left him as he is, which is what makes him, for me, really interesting. So he doesn't have an epic backstory like some of the other gods do. Um, and people sort of think he was actually the most popular god among the local tribes as well. Um, but, you know, we can only really guess at his use. Um, based on those um, living at the fort. And also Newcastle University made the point that in the Iron Age, Britons couldn't read or write, so they had no way of actually preserving the deities. But because the Romans did and adopted local gods, and then they wrote about them, it meant that their descendants could learn about them, which means people like me can then share them with a wider audience. So I'm going to leave you with just a view of Northumberland. Um, and that has been a bit of a whistle stop tour of Northern folklore and there's loads and loads of stuff that I couldn't put in. Um, but I hope it's given you a flavor of the many different creatures that lurk in British legends. And it is a really 
fascinating part of the country. Um, I think people who, who live here are like really fiercely, fiercely attached to it um, because it's so unlike the rest of the country and it does have its own character and things like that. And, you know, we've got the reavers and battlefields and dragons and fairies and, and all this kind of thing. And yes, the land can be desolate and unforgiving and its legendary inhabitants even more so. But I think if you remember that this is their home as much as ours, then you might just escape their notice. And that's the end of me talk. Thank you so much. That was great. I saw a clap there. <laughs>